Karen opens the door and glares at me. Then she smiles and hugs me. You better come in, she says, as I lift the sports bag into the hall. Is that all you're bringing? Says my sister as she sees the bag. I grabbed as much as I could, I say, but, well, Dad was threatening to break my arms if I didn't leave the house straight away. Karen gestures to the worn settee in the small sitting room. Well, you'll have to sleep there, she says. It's not the comfiest. I tell her it'll be fine. I'm not planning on staying long. Just a few days. A week, maybe. Until I get back on my feet. Find somewhere else to stay. Thanks, sis, I say quietly. I didn't know where else to go. Karen asked me what I've done to piss off Dad this time. Oh, you know, the usual, I say. I can't get a job, so I'm not bringing in any money. Usual story, but then Dad starts drinking and starts throwing his fists around. I can't go back, Karen, I say. Not this time. My sister puts her hand on my shoulder. I know, Scott, she says softly. Why do you think I got out when I could? There's a look between us and I think I'm going to cry. Oh, give over, your soppy sod, she says. I'll make you tea. She goes into the kitchen. I can hear her filling the kettle. My sister makes the best tea. Ever since she moved out of our house nearly two years ago, I, I miss her loads. She's, um, she's 20, three years older than me. I never say it to her face, but I reckon she got herself pregnant on purpose. Good excuse to move away from Dad. Get herself a house in the next town. Far enough from Dad. <sighs> what a choice. Dad's fist for life. Or a single mum. Where's Holly? I shout through the kitchen. Oh, she's at playgroup. I'll need to pick her up soon, she replies. She brings through the tea. Did he hurt you? Dad, I mean. She says. Well, not really. I'm too quick for him when he's had a skinful. <laughs> I try and make a joke out of it. Karen sips the tea. So he's, um, he's drinking again, she says. Worse than ever. I came home early from the pub last night and... I, I stop and feel myself going red. And what? says Karen. Well, he caught me in bed with Amber. I mutter. And Karen laughs. Who's Amber? she says. Well, I mean, we're proper going out, but not just, you know, I tell her. She's proper brainy at college, not from the estate. Karen tells me I'm probably a bit of rough. I laugh. You can bring her here if you want, says Karen. Be good to meet her. Tell her what a knobhead she's going out with. <laughs> I throw a cushion at her and she expertly ducks, just like she used to when Dad threw a punch. But if she does come round, no funny business, she says. I don't want my daughter traumatised for life. Amber comes around a few days later. We sit watching the television. I've put the bedding in my bag behind the settee. Karen's upstairs, putting Holly to bed. Amber's playing on her phone. You're not watching this, I say, referring to the TV. I'm bored, she says. Can't we go out? Into town? I shuffle uncomfortably. I've got no money, I say. I'm embarrassed and I see a face fall. I am looking for a job. Got an interview tomorrow. It's a lie and she probably knows it. I've applied for loads of jobs but I haven't heard anything. There's silence between us for a while. So this is where you're sleeping? Asks Amber. It's just temporary, I say, but... i got plans. I'm going to be a millionaire next year, I tell you. I'm turning on the charm and, you know, it works. Amber smiles and kisses me. Oh, good. I like a man with ambition, she tells me softly. I lean in for another kiss, but Amber jumps up. Come on, she says. Let's go for a walk. It's a nice evening. Oh, I say, disappointed. Well, 
I thought we could, you know. Amber looks at me like I'm an idiot. What, with your sister upstairs? She says. <sighs> she hands me my coat and we go out. She puts her arm round me and we walk. Past the shitty pub at the end of the estate. The red line. Up through the alleyway. Dodging the dog shit. And out onto the main road of, towards town. As the traffic roars past us, Amber tells me about college. She wants to be a solicitor. Go to university. My heart sinks a little as she tells me this. Her with her aspirations and goals. Me with sod all. No job. No real place to live. No qualifications. No money. We reach the out-of-town retail park. Oh, want to see what's on at the cinema? Says Amber. I could maybe pay you in if you've got no money. I feel a sense of pride and I tell her no. Amber's phone beeps. She checks it. Scott, she says, a few college mates are in town. They've asked if I want to meet them for a few drinks. You don't mind, dear. She must see my face drop. She smiles. Message me tomorrow, she says, and kisses me on the lips. And make sure you're amazing at your interview. I watch her walk out towards the bus stop. I shout after her, if I get the job, I'll take you out on the town tomorrow. Some hope. I haven't even got an interview. I walk back towards the house. I feel angry and frustrated. I know I'm going to lose Amber if I don't get some money soon. She's not going to hang around forever. I think about asking Karen to lend me some cash, but I can't. She's a single parent. She's skint. She can barely feed a little girl. When I get to the Red Lion, there's a young guy, maybe a few years older than me, standing outside. He's smoking a fag and playing on his phone. Inside the pub, I can hear the sound of laughter and some sports match playing on the TV. The guy looks up and sees me. All right. He shouts over. I put my head down and walk a bit faster. At first I think he's going to try and start a fight. Karen once told me there's plenty of dickheads around here who love to throw their fists around. Are you Karen's brother? He shouts over. I stop and look at him. Yeah, I say. How do you know my sister? The guy walks over. Oh, I've seen her about at the shops. Walking with a little girl, he tells me. He holds out his hand. I'm Jono, he says. I shake his hand suspiciously. Scott, I tell him. You OK, Scott, he says. You look um, pretty pissed off just now. Oh, I tell him it's nothing. You want some of this, he says, offering me what I thought was a cigarette, but is actually a joint. You look like you need it. I take a drag. It's pretty strong. Don't exhale, says Jono. You won't get the same effect. He demonstrates and I feel a bit of a tit. He hands me back the joint and I attempt to copy what Jono did. I cough slightly, but keep it under control. Jono laughs, but you know he's, he's not taking the piss. That's better, he says. It begins to hit me. Thanks, I say. He seems pretty decent then. I find myself talking to him. I tell him about Amber, about the lack of money. I can't even take her to the cinema, I say. He nods and lights up another joint. We share it. I feel, you know, lightheaded, but good. And I can't stop talking. I tell him about Dad and how I had to get away. My old man was just the same, he tells me. Violent bastard. He did the right thing getting out. We finish the joint and Jono tells me he has to get back to the pub. Footy's on, he says. Big match. See you around, Scott. He shakes my hand again and goes to leave. Then he turns to me. Listen, Scott, he says. I might be able to put a bit of work your way. 
There's a few quid in it. I tell him I'm definitely interested. Well, what kind of work? I ask. Delivery work, you know, a bit of weed, a few pills. It's like community service, giving the people what they want. I must look a bit doubtful. Ah, it's a piece of piss, says Jono. Drop the stuff off, pick up the payment. I'm assuming you're not in trouble with the police. I shake my head. Never had any run-ins with the law. And you're clean skin, says Jono. No one's going to look twice at you, especially the cops. Jono reaches into his pocket and pulls out 50 quids in notes. He hands them me. Here you go. Call it an advance. Take your girlfriend out. Show her a good time. I pause. And then I think of Amber out with her mates tonight, having a good time. Maybe I will take her out tomorrow after all. Thanks, Jono, I say, taking the notes. I owe you one. Jono smiles. I'll be in touch in a few days, he says. I know where you're staying. It's 12.30 when the car pulls up outside the house. Karen's picking up Holly from playgroup. Jono sat in the driver's seat. He prefers to come around when Karen's out. Well, don't want any awkward questions, he says. It's a few weeks since I first met Jono. The car arriving at the house has become a bit of a regular thing. Today, Jono winds down the window and passes me the gear. I put it in my bag. Did you take your girlfriend out the other night? He asks. Yeah, we went to the cinema. Took her out for something to eat afterwards, I say. Think she was impressed. Jono smiles and hands me some more notes. Here you go, Scott, he says. There must be a couple of hundred quid. Get yourself a bike, he says. Make your life easier. <laughs> I can't believe it. Hundred quid. Mind if I use your toilet, he says. I'm desperate. He gets out the car and I show him, in, show him into the house. When he's finished, he comes downstairs. Nice place your sister's got, he says. She's done it up well. He's about to go when suddenly he remembers something. He, he, he reaches into his pocket and pulls out a phone. Oh, what's this, I say as he hands the phone to me. Present. So I can get hold of you, he tells me. Business phone. Later that afternoon, I take the 62 cross town. I clutch my bag, aware that its contents are worth a lot of money. Inside my jacket, I have the phone that Jono gave me. The bus is quiet, just me and an old woman. I'm convinced she keeps looking at me and I begin to get, you know, self-conscious. I shuffle down in my seat and pull my hood over my face. I get off the 62 at Queensway and head up to Hayden Hill. This is our turf, as Jono likes to call it. Well, Jono's right. A bike would make things easier. I look at the time and I message Amber. Want to meet in town later? Seconds later she responds. You taking me out again? You win the lottery or something? It makes a difference having money to do stuff. Take her out. The streets are pretty quiet this afternoon. I'm just putting my phone back in my pocket when I hear sudden sounds behind me. A car screeching tyres, shouts. I look around but... Immediately, I feel something hard slam into the side of my head. The blow sends me staggering backwards. I trip off the curbstone. As I lay in the road, my head pounding, dazed and confused. I realise the bag is lying a few feet away from me. I can taste blood in my mouth. I make a feeble grab for the bag, but a boot crashes down on my fingers. I look up and I see the backs of two figures. One is standing on my hand, while the other bends and quickly grabs the bag. I hear one of them shout something to the other, then get into the car. Screeching tyres again as the car disappears up the road. I stagger to my feet. For a split second I think about calling the police. 
and then I remember what was in the bag and how much it was worth. Shit, what's Jono going to say? After everything he's done for me, I've let him down. How could I be so stupid as to get robbed? I reach into my pocket, take out the phone that Jono gave me. I take a deep breath and I call him. It's the day after and Jono sits opposite me in the sitting room. He's early today. I can't tell what he's thinking. His face is giving nothing away. Karen comes in and clocks Jono. Aren't you going to introduce us? She says to me. I'm Jono, he says, and I'm relieved he's smiling. I've seen you about, he adds. Karen doesn't say anything to him. She turns back to me. Stinks in here, she says, undrawing the curtains and opening the window. Your face is a total mess. I know she's wanting me to tell her about how I got the bruise. I just look at the floor. I'm going to pick up Polly, she says. Haven't you got jobs to be looking for? She leaves without looking at Jono. I hear the front door slam. Jono's silent for a minute. I can't stand it. I'm sorry, Jono, I say. They jumped me. There was nothing I could do. He, he cuts me off. It's out of order, he says. You weren't on anyone else's territory. Whoever jumped you are not playing by the rules. I relax a bit. He looks like he's on my side. But the thing is, he continues, it's not just me. There's others. And they're going to be asking questions. I'm not sure what he means by others. I thought this was just something between me and him. That gear was worth 5k. It's a lot of money, Scott. I nod and I feel myself begin to sweat. It was meant to be an easy bit of money. I'm starting to get a bad feeling about the whole thing. Look, Jono, I say, I think I want out. I'm sorry about what's happened, but again, he cuts me off. It's not that simple, he says. Unless you want to pay me back the money you lost last night. I tell him there's no way I can do that. I've nothing to give. Well, it's not just the fives k Scott. There's the money I've lent you over the last few weeks. With interest, it all adds up. He tells me what I have to work to pay off what I owe him. But, but that'll take months, I say. A debt's a debt, Scott, he says. Besides, look on the positive side. You'll have money for extras. After all that, girlfriend of yours is... Pretty high maintenance, he says. Nice legs. Her sister's pretty hot too. Lottie, isn't it? Looks great in a school uniform. How does Jono know about Amber's sister? He's never met Amber or her sister. Unless... Shit! Does he know where they live? Her sister's only 14. The silence between us for a moment. I'll be in touch, says Jono, getting up. Moments later, I hear the car drive off. I look at the photograph of my three-year-old niece on the wall. A crooked smile, a tooth missing. Totally cute, totally oblivious. What have I gotten involved in? One day, Karen is making Holly's dinner. She's long since stopped asking me about job interviews or even when I'm planning to leave. I'm in the kitchen, playing with my niece, picking her up and turning her upside down. Holly is giggling wildly. Put her down now, Scott. Holly, your dinner's ready, says Karen. Holly sits at the table and starts to eat a tin spaghetti. She catches my eye and Shows me the contents of her mouth. I wink at her and she smiles. Poor kid. She seems to live off spaghetti hoops. I take Karen to one side. 
Here's some rent, I say, giving her a pile of notes. She takes it warily. Where did you get those hundred notes from? She asks. The mysterious Jono. I tell her I'm helping him out, you know, odd jobs. She gives me that face that says, oh, I don't believe you. Well, I won't say it won't come in useful, she says, taking the money. Just don't tell me where it came from. I tell Karen I'm going out and going to the hallway and putting on my trainers. She follows me. See you, Amber, she asks, her arms folded. Maybe later, I, I say. Karen looks at my trainers. Then you, she says. I tell her I got them in the sale. Bollocks, she says. I've seen them in the shops. They're fetching over 100 quid. She shuts the door so that Holly won't hear. Did you nick them, Scott? She says. I promise her on Holly's life that I didn't steal them. She glares at me. Don't you ever swear on my daughter's life. I mumble an apology. Scott, she says. I don't want that Jono coming round here again. I try to protest, but she cuts me off. I don't trust him, she says. If I see him round here again, I'm throwing you out. Understood? I feel a rising panic and an anger rising up inside me. If only Karen knew how impossible it is to wipe out Jono from my life. I'll see who I want to, I shout her. You're not my fucking mother. I see her face drop. She wasn't expecting that aggression. I'm sorry. I didn't mean. And then I'm crying. Huge fucking tears. I haven't cried like this for years. Not even when Dad was at his worst. Karen holds me tight. Holly stood watching at the kitchen door. It's okay, says Karen. Uncle starts a bit upset. She takes me into the sitting room. What have you got involved in? She says gently after a while. And I tell her everything. The drop-offs, the money, the threats, the debt I have to pay back, the robbery. I'm not even sure that was real anymore. I wouldn't put it past Jono to have staged the whole thing. I'm scared, I tell her. She hugs me again. Oh, you dickhead. She whispers in my ear, but she doesn't let go of me. After a while, I say, that's not all. The other day I was in Jono's car. I, I, I saw a gun in the glove compartment. She looks at me. We need to go to the police, she says. I can't, Karen, please. These people, they, they could do anything. Not just to me. I look towards the kitchen where Holly is still eating her dinner. Besides, I've broken the law. This ain't no petty crime stuff. This is class A gear. There's a knock on the door. We both know it's Jono. I've got to go, I say. It's been three months since I first met Jono. Today he's sitting in the armchair at the house and smoking a fag. A couple of his mates are here too. Skagsy and Nixie. I don't know the real names. Karen left last week. She's gone back to Dad's for a while. She reckoned despite Dad's temper, Holly would be safer there than here. I've got to think of Holly, she said the day she left and took the suitcase. It's only for a while. I'll think of a way to sort it. My own stupidity has driven her back to Dad. I let Jono and his mates take over the house. Jono reminds me of the debt I owe him every now and again. There's a knock on the door. I pull back the curtain slightly and see a tall guy with greasy hair standing at the door. He's expected. I let him into the hallway and shut the front door behind him. As I do so, I see the old woman across the road peering out of a window. Nosy old cow. The guy's sweating in his... Slightly agitated. Looks like someone needs the gear, says Jono, coming into the hall. I take out the small cling film package from the bag and hand it to the greasy-haired guy. He hands me the money. He doesn't speak. I check the money and nod at Jono and 
the guy leaves. Another satisfied customer, says Jono. Today I'm heading up to a different town, about 60 miles away. It's a bit of a trek on the train. Some of the houses here are posh as fuck. It's far removed from the estate as you can imagine. But, you know, there's other houses too. Areas where there's obviously less money. Rich pickings here, Jono had said before I left. There's loads of them dependent on their gear. This evening I'm sitting in some flat 60 miles away from home. Definitely a lot, one of the posh ones I'd seen near the centre of town. Jono had given me the address and a key. The flat has an intercom. It's a dive. Dark and I can smell damp. I'm so hungry. But I forgot to pick up something to eat. Besides, there's nowhere to cook. Not even a microwave. Jono messaged me on the work phone, as he calls it. You there yet? I take out my own phone and I message Amber. Again, I'm, I'm not expecting a reply. She, she hasn't been in contact for weeks. Got fed up with me being around Jono. Suspicious of how I was getting my money. Given what Jono threatened, she's probably best far away from me. Suddenly I hear the intercom buzz. I look on the camera that's been installed. The guy looks thin but tall and, and suddenly I feel scared. This guy could do anything. Have anything. A knife. A gun. I've seen it. Some of these people are desperate. We'll do anything for the gear. You're going to let me up? I hear through the intercom. I press the button and wait. The gear is laid out on the table. The rest is hidden. Slowly, I get up and I open the door. <laughs> 